It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexander Van der Horst from George Washington University. Uh, he's on the faculty of astrophysics there. He earned a double <coughs> master's degree in astronomy and theoretical physics at the University of Amsterdam, and then a PhD in astrophysics at the same university. After that, he uh, became a NASA postdoctoral program fellow at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. <coughs> and then uh, that was followed by three years of additional postdoctoral research at the University of Amsterdam. He then took up his present position on the faculty at George Washington University. <coughs> he, uh, Dr. Van der Horst observes and models sources of transient emissions. Those are brief, very energetic explosions of energy or other radiation, of, of energy and radiation. And the sources are most among the most extreme objects in the universe. Some of those sources have been in the news lately. There have been several uh, observed black hole, uh, black hole mergers that produce gravitational waves, and a single neutron-neutron star merger that produced gravitational waves. And that is just basically this past two years has ushered in a new and very powerful way for us to learn about what's out there. Uh, Dr. Van der, Horst, Van der Horst participated in the analysis of the neutron-neutron star merger, uh, which is the first of these gravitational wave sources for which we were able to localize the so get electromagnetic radiation that enabled us to localize the source and, and see what object it was that exploded. Uh, so that gave us the position of the source and the various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum put together with the gravitational wave signal gave us an incredibly detailed picture of what happened there. Uh, Dr. Van der Horst does several things. He develops and applies computer codes to extract information from the data, but he also measures these first events using gamma ray satellites in space and radio telescopes all over the world. <clears throat> He's uh, worked extensively with the lo famous LOFAR, the Low Frequency Array in Europe, and the very large array in New Mexico. And in the near future, he'll also be obtaining data from the wonderfully named Meerkat in South Africa. <laughs> Somehow, those little animals looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of them at the same time. They're yes. cool. <laughs> <laughs> so they're in red, yes. <laughs> Dr. Van der Horst uh, leads a team of 50 scientists from around the world to develop a new instrument, the OctoCam, developing its software uh, and uh, lots of other things connected with that project. It's going to be a very fast imager and spectrograph, and it will be used on the Gran Telescopia Canarias in the Canary Islands and in the 8-meter Gemini telescope. And the OctoCam on Gemini will enable quick follow-up observations and interesting sources when they're found by the new Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Uh, he's won uh, a lot of very prestigious awards, and today he's going to tell us about hunting for jets in the radio sky. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation and, and for the very kind introduction. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I, uh, I always uh, enjoy these kind of uh, presentations best if I have a lot of interaction with the audience. So if you have any questions on the way, uh, please ask them. If there are too many, I will also then ignore them for a little while. Uh, I, always, I feel that this audience is uh, quite inquisitive. Um, but uh, please do um, ask me questions um, if you have any. So, um, yes, I, and, uh, I'm going to talk about, as I said here, hunting for jets in the radio sky. Um, as, as you just heard in, my, in the introduction, I, yes, oh, there's a very bright light here, so Sorry. I cannot always see your uh, hands up. Yes. Are you going to talk about the synthesis of heli uh, heavy elements in the kilonova? Uh, not really, but if you would like, we can always talk about a little bit um, all the way at the end. Okay, but it's not, yeah. that's fine. Yes. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I'll be talking about um, 
uh, kind of focusing, let's say, on the radio part of the spectrum, in order to really understand a lot of things that are going on in the universe, and we have to look at the entire spectrum, all the way from the radio uh, to the gamma rays. Um, so, but most of the things that I look at, most of what I do is uh, looking at very um, uh, transient objects, so things that suddenly pop up and then disappear again. Um, and in the uh, overall in astronomy, uh, we're kind of entering this new era of what we call time domain astronomy. So looking for these variable new things on the sky that are very short lived. Um, and radio is there is, is a very large part of that. So what I want to talk about first, give you a bit of a feel for what kind of objects we are looking at and looking for, um, and then also talk about what kind of new developments there are uh, and how we can look for these things. So um, just as a very brief kind of uh, historic uh, overview, uh, just to go go <laughs> a long uh, time in the in the past, um, and we. And we all know already for a long time that there are variable things out there. The, the universe is not static. Things are changing. There are new objects popping up on the sky. Uh, um, this has been known for a very long time. And uh, in, in Western Europe, uh, the kind of earliest, most famous example is um, in 1572 uh, when uh, Tycho Brahe, uh, a Danish astronomer, and, and his contemporaries saw this new, uh, this new star on the sky, and then wrote a whole book about it. Uh, and here you see a painting of the astronomer, uh, with all these people around it. It's kind of hard to see, but they all look very scared, and for some reason he looks like he's going to defend all humankind against this new thing. I don't know, I don't know how he's going to do it, but it's kind of what, what it looks like. Um, but if you now um, go to the same part of the sky, and he actually wrote down a very clear a chart of um, where the source is compared to other stars. If you now go to the same part of the sky with a, uh, a satellite um, that we have now, then this object over here, this, this red um, kind of circle, um, is the, uh, exactly that position uh, that was described by uh, Tycho Brahe, and now we know that it is the remnant of a supernova explosion. Uh, a very massive star that died at the end of its life, and what we see there now is the, the remnant of that. And um, of course already uh, way before that there have been um, other reports uh, in, in, for instance, in Chinese um, manuscripts of these kind of new stars on the sky uh, and we see uh, there have been many of those uh, throughout history. But this is what we could see just with the naked eye and of course as you all know uh, we have our, all our favorite tools to, uh, to look at these objects, uh, whether it is from the ground, uh, with large um, uh, optical light telescopes. Uh, example here, very large telescopes in, in Chile. There, the William Herschel Telescope um, in Canary Islands, and of course, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. And if you have these large telescopes, and even also some smaller ones, um, you can find many of these new stars, these new objects on the sky. And this is just an, uh, an example of, um, of two of these, actually, of, of Already, that's already almost 10 years ago. Um, uh, I actually did observations on these ones myself uh, with uh, radio telescopes. Um, so what you see here is a galaxy, um, roughly the same size as our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and then there is two new objects that uh, popped up within about a week of each other. And, um, and these are very bright. As you can see, just one of these is almost as bright as basically the entire galaxy together, right? So one of these supernovae, uh, for just for about a week or so, is as bright as the hundred billion stars that are in that one galaxy. Uh, so these are extremely bright events, um, and uh, you see here one, and a week later there was another one. Um, actually, because these two happened so close to each other, they, they for a while they called it the supernova factory. Uh, but actually, there, we now we see, find so many of those, uh, and also at the same time in the same galaxy, um, and it's not that special um, anymore. But um, and the main point is that now we're getting better and better in finding these new objects on the sky. And when we start really looking at those, there uh, turns out it's not only big stars that explode, but there's many um, sources out there. Is that NGC 2770? Sorry? Is that NGC? Oh yeah, or NDC, sorry. Okay. NDC 2770. Okay. All right. <laughs> 
Sorry? What is the XRF? Um, so it was actually found first in the x-rays, um, so they thought it was an x-ray flash, um, and then it turned out to be um, a regular uh, a supernova. Yeah, so uh, actually this one is kind of interesting. This was found first, uh, and they were monitoring uh, had this uh, galaxy with the Swift um, satellite, and suddenly they found in the galaxy, they found this one over here. Um, and so there was an X-ray flash, and then suddenly was a bright. So are there two distinct source. objects out there? Or are those yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. They're completely um, separate from each other. Yeah. I mean, they're they're completely different sides of, of the same galaxy, and so they have nothing to do with each other. It was just just yeah chance coincidence that that, that happened. And, um, and yeah. And so now you know. At first, people thought it was maybe some special kind of gamma ray burst. I will get to those later. Um, but uh, then with follow-up observations, especially actually the radio observations of this one uh, really showed that this, this was kind of a normal um, supernova. We just had an interesting x-ray flash. Yes? Yeah, one says 2007, the other says 2008. Yes, so this were was... Were they a year apart? No, 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 this, this was actually, this was uh, end of December of 2007. Oh, I and see. This was early January oh, okay. uh, 2008. Okay. Yeah. What are the two objects below mm. the galaxy? Straddle the these two? Yes. Oh, these these two are uh, foreground stars. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, and this one over here, uh, there was nothing here, but there was in 1999 there was another supernova, um, actually of the same type as the other two in that same galaxy. This was another reason to call it like a supernova factory because there were so many going off. Probably um, go for a thousand years and there won't be any more. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you can't get even one in the Milky Way for hundreds of years. Right, correct. <laughs> correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're the same yeah. kind of supernovae, but they differ very much in magnitude. Yes, but they uh, they were both um, type one uh, B one uh, BBC supernovae, um, and so so actually at their peak, because of course they were um, about a week apart. Um, at, the, at their peak, they were roughly the same uh, same magnitude. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> so. Um, they better be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and now, of course, we know that there are many, many different kind of transient uh, new sources out there. As kind of sources can give us a <coughs> burst of emission that we see, uh, and a lot of those actually have jets. I, I, I started talking about uh, hunting for jets. A lot of these sources have jets. There's a lot of interesting physics happening. Um, so what kind of sources are we then finding? Uh, gamma ray bursts, I will, I will talk about a little bit. Uh, compact binary mergers, which has everything to do with gamma ray bursts, but also uh, with the gravitational wave events. Then there are the active galactic nuclei, um, which can sometimes be... Uh, not so active, but then suddenly get re-energized in so-called tidal disruption events. I'll talk about those. And then also um, uh, so-called X-ray binaries, where you have a regular star and a compact object, uh, and they um, go around each other, and interesting things can happen. So basically, uh, anything that has to do with the death of stars, uh, black holes, neutron stars, very extreme objects. And so what I then like to, to study uh, is kind of the, the physics in these extreme conditions. Uh, so where there is extreme gravity, now let's think about uh, black holes, extreme densities, neutron stars, the densest uh, objects in the, in the universe, um, extreme magnetic fields, so-called magnetars, which are neutron stars with extreme magnetic fields, um, extreme energy releases in, for instance, gamma ray bursts, uh, tidal forces that can be very extreme in tidal disruption events, and then these extreme outflows called jets, these collimated outflows where material gets um, accelerated to almost the speed of light uh, and then giving off a lot of um, radiation. So, so what we're trying to do is get observations over the entire spectrum of light uh, of these objects, these variable objects, you think that vary over time and then try to figure out how physics basically works, or test how some of the physics works under these extreme conditions. And so, yes? Is that last one mm -hmm. similar to coronal mass ejections from our own sun? 
Uh, no, 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 no. This is this is extremely narrow, uh, narrowly focused. I will show some examples in okay. a little bit. Um, yeah, no. Th these are these are really can be almost like pencil beam uh, in a sense, kind of compared to the object where it comes from. Very uh, thin okay. kind of beam coming out. Um, Angular momentum is important in these. It's not enough. Sorry. Angular momentum is important in these. Oh yes, absolutely. And not in a coronal mm -hmm. mass ejection. Correct. Correct. So, um, and as I said, so, so to actually study these things, we have to really uh, cover the entire spectrum of light, going all the way from gamma rays, the most energetic radiation, to X-rays, UV, visible light, infrared light, microwaves, all the way to the um, to the radio, and to really get a full understanding of all of these objects. So, we really want to observe these things also across the entire spectrum, not only with the, uh, the visible light telescopes, uh, but because they only give us a very small piece of the puzzle. And so if we first go to the, uh, the high energy part of the spectrum, uh, the gamma rays, uh, there's a famous example here, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatories, it was in the 90s, and detected a lot of uh, interesting sources in gamma rays. Nowadays there's the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which I also worked on for, for several years. Um, and so, and this is an instrument that can find very high energy phenomena in the universe. If you then go down a little bit to the X-rays, you see that at Chandra X-ray Observatory, uh, so um, it can detect X-rays, very faint sources of X-rays, and, and, and determine the positions very accurately. Um, but then if we go to the other side of the spectrum, uh, that I want to kind of focus on here, uh, that is the radio. And uh, there are two basically main, let's say, types of um, radio observatories. One is there um, on the right um, is basically the one, the big dishes. Uh, this, of course, is a very famous one, the uh, Arecibo. Um, uh, actually, at the moment, hard, having a hard time in uh, Puerto Rico, but hopefully everything will be okay there. Um, however, this is just this enormous dish. And it is there actually um, on the on the ground, um, and some of them, of course, these single dishes are are, are standing, uh, but this one is there uh, on the ground. Um, this one, of course, also has is very famous for the fact that James Bond in one of his movies was running and sliding <laughs> through this one. Uh, I think it was Goldeneye. Um, so this is one type of um, of radio observatories. Uh, the other type is. Uh, the type, as shown here on the left, like the very large array in New Mexico, is a so-called interferometer. Where you do not have one big dish, but you have multiple antennae, and you combine the signals from all these antennae, and then try to make an image of the radio sky. And, where you <coughs> and the way this works is that the, the, the total the distance between all these antennae, so the outermost antennae, and with those you can basically make one big dish that is as large as the largest distance between those antennae. And there, there are definitely some caveats there because there's a lot of space, of course, missing between these antennae, so you have to kind of fill those in. That's sort of a lot of tricks to do this. Um, is that but does that con relative to a continuous disk? Uh -huh. Does that con uh, contribute noise, say something like that? Oh, yes, yes, no, that is definitely, that makes things much more difficult. The problem, of course, is making, uh, making a, a single dish. Um, telescope of that uh, of that size is just impossible. So, uh, so yeah, there's definitely um, a lot of kind of practical things there in the uh, combining the signals uh, in, in 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 a way that you can actually do this properly is not that easy. Um, what you one thing that you can actually do that helps is uh, actually one thing that really helps is the fact that the Earth rotates. Um, so we get that one for free um, because at the moment the the Earth rotates, the whole array basically rotates and it starts to fill in some of the space in between those different arms. Uh, but still there's there are still gaps and that also uh, that actually gives you can give you a lot of artifacts in your images that you have to correct for. Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking I, I was there and I thought they were on track you know, yes. in a wide shape. Mm -hmm. And if you want sensitivity you bring things close in, but then if you want resolution you Take things way out. Correct. There's a trade-off which 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 you want to favor. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's the. I mean, it's it's the. 
Yeah, so there's, there's two, uh, two things. So basically, the, um, the kind of the resolution that you have uh, on, the, on the sky, that depends on two things. One is the wavelength uh, head that you're looking at, that you're observing at. And the other one is how big is your, uh, is your, is your collecting area. So basically, how big is the, uh, the, the, is the distance between the longest elements in your array. And so, uh, so, yeah, so depending on what you're looking at, if you want to look at things that are kind of diffuse uh, on the sky, then uh, you want to have everything very compact because you get a lot of sensitivity but not good angular resolution. If you want to look at things that are just point sources, uh, but you want to, to look at them in very good resolutions, then actually you try to put the antennae as far uh, away as possible. Uh, and actually the, 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 the VLA goes through the cycle of different configurations uh, over the year. Uh, so you can have these, depending on what your science is and what you want to look at, uh, you can have these different configurations. Yeah, and there's other telescopes that work um, exactly the same, the same way. Yeah. Even within one conf given configuration, you can kind of trick the data in a sense, because every antenna has its own, of course there's its own data, and then you correlate with the other antennae. So if you, even if you have the very kind of compact configuration, you can say, well, I'm going to leave out some of the ones in the middle, so only going to take the data of those that are further away, and then you can still get a good resolution image. You, of course, you lose a lot of sensitivity because you throw away data, but in principle, if the source is very bright, that is, that is possible. So you can kind of play, in that sense, you can kind of play with the radio interferometry data that you cannot do with an optical telescope, for instance. Yeah. So... <coughs> Okay, so this is the uh, looking at the entire spectrum, and, um, and 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 why is this important? And why is this important in uh, in jet sources? So first of all, um, oh sorry, hey, let's look uh, look at some uh, jets that are um, that are very very large that are actually relatively easy to see before we start to zoom in uh, to the smaller objects. And this is an example. Um, of um, a large galaxy, Centaurus A, uh, and you can see here on the left is the optical visible light image. Um, you see there's, there's the galaxy in the middle, which is also this dark band of uh, gas, and dust, uh, gas and dust there. On the right, on top of the um, optical light image, there is um, sub-millimeter observations in the kind of orangey reddish color. And so over here, and also over here, and then there's also in the blue, there is x-rays with the Chandra x-ray satellite. And here you see uh, this kind of sharp jet feature coming out. And um, if we now look at a different galaxy, it's maybe even, it's even easier to see. Um, a galaxy called M87, where, um, <coughs> again, if you look at the kind of larger scales, <coughs> if you look now in the radio, you can see that from some central point, and this is actually where the galaxy is, there's a very narrow kind of pencil-like feature coming out here. This is all radio emission. Then it kind of like bumps into surrounding medium, and then uh, you get these big lobes around it. Um, if we now zoom in into that box there, you get, you see, like you, right there on the right, you see then uh, a Hubble uh, space telescope image of that same object. And if we now focus in on just this little point here, all the way in the middle, in the middle of the galaxy, right, and down here you see an image uh, in the radio. And so on the left you see what it looks like in optical, there is this, and there's this jet-like thing coming out. But if we zoom in all the way in the middle, you see a very bright colored object over here, uh, and then there is this jet coming out. And the only way to go that deep uh, and see that all the way down there, is if we use this interferometry uh, trick, but then to the extreme. So not just interferometry with uh, the VLA, so in New Mexico, but actually use radio telescopes over the entire continent, over all of the US, and combine those together. Because then the distances between the antennae are even bigger, so you get an even better resolution and looking at these objects on the sky. So that's how you can actually look all the way to the middle of this galaxy uh, and find there where, where this central object is and how this jet is coming out of the object. 
And this is another way <coughs> to look at this. And here you see now um, with uh, on the, the bottom left the VLA radio. You see Chandra X-rays, and then you see the Hubble Space Telescope um, optical light. And this is at the larger scales. But again, if you really want to know what's going on all the way here in this little point, and you really have to take radio observations using these antennae very far away from each other, combining that to, to zoom in. So, um, and these are uh, very uh, narrow things, these jets. Um, there's a lot of energy in there, there's a lot of light produced. Um, <coughs> but it turns out that these are actually variable. <coughs> Uh, these are not steady things. Uh, there's different ways to look at this. For instance, here on the, on the left you see the same jet, M87. Uh, this is actually with Hubble uh, observations where you see in the middle here, and there is a, seems like a little knot there, that over time, these are different observations, get brighter and then dimmer. So there are things happening in that jet. And so very energetic things uh, and where this light is produced. Where's the elliptical galaxy? That's a huge elliptical galaxy. Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's definitely enormous. And that's not seen in the... So, right. So this, so this is basically zooming in uh, into the, um, in the, the core of the galaxy, which is an active okay. galactic uh, okay. nucleus. So there's a supermassive black hole there, yep. um, and it's creating matter, and it's then, uh, and there's this jet coming out. There's probably actually two, where there's one jet in our direction and the other one kind of going away from us. It's huge. It's six billion solar masses, isn't it? <coughs> something like that. So, yeah, it's something like huge. that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Yes, it's really an enormous one. So what, what's the length of those jets that we can see on, on the diagram oh. there? So, well, as you can see here, they're actually way larger than the, the galaxy itself. So, and here you see the uh, kind of the, okay. the, the image of the galaxy itself, and here you see the jets coming out. Okay. Mm. Right. So, so these these jets, they they are enormous. Mm. Uh, compared to the, the galaxies themselves, and some of them they keep going and going, and at some point the, they start to interact with the, the in so-called intergalactic medium, uh, so the medium in between the galaxies, and they can produce these enormous radio lobes um, uh, of the interaction of the jet with that material that slams into it, and particles are accelerated and start to radiate radio emission. Um, and these, these objects are, are orders of magnitude larger than the actual galaxy then this jet was coming from. Okay. Yeah. So, <coughs> so these are these, um, and this is something we can still, uh, that can do with, with, with Hubble, is of course the best um, resolution we can do in optical light. Uh, but if you now go in radio, and really zoom in, uh, in that, that, that central area of these galaxies, then you can sometimes see these little blobs of material and light coming out there and, and moving, and actually moving very, very fast. So these are already pretty old observations of 92, 93, 94, and 1995, um, where from the center here, and there is, there is an object are actually moving in two directions in this case. And, um, and it turns out if you just measure how fast they are moving, this, this matter must be moving with almost the speed of light. Um, but the scale here, over which this is measured, is five milli arc seconds. This is a about a factor of a hundred better resolution than the Hubble uh, Space Telescope has, and it's purely with by the, f the fact of using these radio telescopes very far away from each other, combining these and getting this extremely good resolution. So, and so, and but these are still very large objects. These these active galactic nuclei, these jets coming out of galaxies, these are very very big. Um, and, and they can already show uh, this kind of variability, things are moving in jets. Um, so what we really want to do is look at more of these things at different scales, also smaller scales, and, and, we, and uh, we think uh, that there are jets involved uh, there as well, and try to figure out what's going on in these sources. So the first thing is, of course, we have to find these sources. We have to find these jet sources before we can study them. And the way that this works, is, um, first of all, most of the time we need some X-ray or gamma ray satellites to look for these things. I already mentioned the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory earlier, Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Uh, the SWIFT Gamma Ray Burst Mission is also very good for this. Um, and they can really slow very fast to something happening on the sky. 
Um, and also something now already for, for quite a while that's really big is um, going after sources that are detected by, let's say, a gamma ray or an X-ray satellite and then trying to find the optical emission uh, with a robotic telescope. Uh, and this is one of the earlier uh, ones, the uh, so-called Rotsi um, telescope. And uh, what these telescopes can typically do is once, a, let's say, gamma or an X-ray satellite finds something, then they send a signal down to Earth, and then this, uh, it found something in that part of the sky, this, this location, and then it will send a signal to whoever wants to receive those and does uh, research into this. Uh, and it can also be directly to, let's say, a robotic telescope that then starts observing immediately. And so these kind of telescopes, they are completely fully automatic, and they can also then, um, oh, that didn't work. Let's see. Oh, I do it. Okay. Well, I can show that. I can show that later. I'm not sure whether it doesn't work. Um, okay, but the, but uh, the, the <coughs> this very short video where you see this telescope just moving very quickly and can basically start observing just within a few seconds after receiving the signal and start to look for uh, the the counterpart of whatever the other satellite has found. And, um, and this is how the hunt for a lot of these transient sources that have jets uh, happens. First example um, of that is uh, uh, gamma ray bursts. That's a famous, uh, um, very famous example of the, the most extreme explosions in the universe. Um, were detected in the late 60s, reported in the early 70s in gamma rays, very bright sources. At first, people did not know where they were ever coming from, whether they were in our own galaxy or in galaxies very far away. Um, and it basically it took until they found other kind of radiation than the gamma rays, so optical light, X-ray light, and radio light, to really pinpoint where these sources are on the sky. Because that was necessary to really figure out what these things are. And now we know that these, these very big explosions, and we, we, we really have learned a lot about the, the physics, the astrophysics behind these sources. How would we fare if one of these were to occur within the Milky Way? Sorry? How would we fare here if one of these? Uh, well, so um, well as I will as I will, uh, as I will uh, show, they actually they have jets. Um, if gamma ray bursts. Yes, and if those if those jets would be pointing like straight in our direction, and we in our galaxy, that would not be very good for us. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing is that those jets are, are, are fairly narrow, yeah. so there's a pretty big chance that they would not be pointed at us. At us. Um, of course, I mean, there are, uh, there are certainly ideas that some of the extinction periods in, uh, in the history of the Earth, maybe some of them, them may have been caused by, let's say, a supernova going off in our own galaxy that was relatively nearby. Um, and so, and of course, yeah, if it would happen then with a gamma ray burst, that's something, it, so some people look into this, but maybe in the past it would, was a gamma ray burst or a supernova going off uh, and that would then have caused, if it was near enough, it would maybe have caused some trouble here on Earth. Yeah. What's fascinating is that no two gamma ray bursts are the same. Mm -hmm. right. They're all different. Mm -hmm. Every correct. one. Yes, correct, correct. <laughs> well, the, so the interesting thing also is that the, the gamma rays are always different, at least the, the, the way that they vary uh, over time, the, 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 the gamma rays. Yeah. Um, but uh, if you look at their, um, their spectra, so the, the, uh, how it changes over energy, uh, there, seem, there seem to be a lot of kind of commonalities. And if you look at the, the, the light at other parts of the spectrum, um, there there's actually much more commonality between from burst to burst. Because really the initial burst of gamma rays, which is very erratic and very different from one to the other, but the other kind of emission that we see seems to be more, you can, it's easier to kind of generalize that in the kind of uh, certain types of behavior. Yeah. And so and these were the um, <coughs> discovery images here on the left. Um, at the top, uh, the, uh, in the x-rays, this was in 1997, uh, where on the left you see a very bright x-ray source, and a few days later that was gone. Uh, and there, the optical light, you see a very bright source over here, uh, and about a week later that was gone. 
So what you see here is that these transient sources can just pop up and then disappear very, very quickly. So you have to be fast. And that's why, that's why we have these satellites and telescopes set up to do very fast kind of follow-up and try to find these things. And, um, and now we know, and I'm afraid that these videos are also not going to work. Why. Something down in the corner, lower left corner. Is no, yeah, yeah. no, I think it's going to go to the next page. Okay. I'm not sure why. <coughs> Well, for those of you interested, you can always look at these, these later, but uh, th these are basically just illustrations of kind of the two um, mechanisms and the two scenarios that we think of when we think about gamma ray bursts. Um, the first one, so what we think is that the largest fraction of these gamma ray bursts, about let's say 80% of them, um, are kind of extreme supernovae. So extremely massive stars get to the ends of their lives and um, the cores contract and slam together, um, and instead of forming a, a neutron star, they will probably actually form a black hole. So, <clears throat> and these are the kind of sources of which we think uh, that they produce um, uh, black holes. And um, the outer layers are then, uh, they, they uh, of course, just like in a supernova explosion, there's some material going in all directions, but the kind of special thing here is that you have these jets coming out at the same time, uh, which uh, produce a lot of, a lot of, uh, energy, there's a lot of energy released, radiation produced, and if you look straight into those jets, and then you see that basically as a flash of gamma rays uh, coming towards us, and then after that you see the other radiation uh, that we see, x-rays, visible light, radio light. The other scenario um, is the merger of two compact objects, being either two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole. And over time, they're, they're go, they're, if you have two of those, they're going around each other in a binary system. Over time, they will get closer and closer to each other, and at some point, they, they will clash. You get a big merger, and you get a big um, explosion. And again, again, there will be a jet produced, and if you're looking straight into that jet, right, then you will see a big flash of gamma rays. So these are kind of the main um, scenarios for this. So, as well, of course, there's this big um, splash in the, ray, in, in the gamma rays, there's x-rays, optical, so, so how about the radio in this case? Well, it turned out that the, um, seeing these sources in the radio uh, was very important in, in trying to understand a few uh, very key um, points about these sources. Because with radio, as we've already seen, if you have these, um, the, these antennae very far away from each other, you can really zoom into these objects. So you can really measure their um, their sizes on the sky because they are, they are extremely small and they're not very small themselves because they're so far away they're billions of light years away they're just a little point on the sky but if you can zoom in enough you can actually measure their um, their source size and, and the only way to do that is in the radio so from radio observations uh, we can get size measurements then you immediately start to understand how these size change over time you start to understand how the jet evolves over time also, how actually this collimation of the jet really works. Uh, that's all information that you can basically only get from the radio. And there's other kinds of information you can get from x-rays and optical light, but the radio is very crucial for this. Uh, and of course, in this context, and I just mentioned the, uh, the merger of two neutron stars, uh, of course, the gravitational wave event, as it was already, already mentioned earlier, I'm sure many of you have heard about, um, and that, of course, there was... And that was a case of two neutron stars slamming into each other, and there was this, this burst of gravitational waves, and there was also a burst of gamma rays. A short burst of gamma rays, and so a short gamma ray burst, um, and then all kinds of other emissions. And um, the, the kind of the role of the radio there, um, actually in the first kind of, let's say, new splash of this big event, um, radio didn't play a very big role. I mean, radio, some radio was detected, but um, this is actually going to play a very big role. Because right now, in, most of the information that we have was the fact that there was this big gravitational wave event, there was a, a flash of gamma rays, um, there was some, and there was a lot of um, optical and infrared light um, was, was found. Um, there was some x-rays a little bit later and some radio. But it was much later than all the rest, like a couple of weeks later. And actually right now, uh, there's observations are going on uh, of, of following this source and seeing what happens 
um, in, with this radio source. And what's really going to help there, and what the radio is going to do, is basically going to tell us really uh, what kind of emission did we actually see to start with. Um, was there a jet and how narrow was this jet? How was this kind of or uh, oriented towards us or not? Uh, there's all kinds of models right now that can all exist happily next to each other because there's not enough data. But once we get all the radio data in, then we can actually really tell what was going on with this source. So, uh, although it's going to, it's going to uh, probably um, take a few months before that is all kind of collected and people have, have done modeling work, uh, but this is kind of where these things are right now. So, um, as for the radio part is going to be also in this case very crucial. Was, was the delay for the radio due to the emission was delayed or the propagation was delayed? So that's a very good question. Um, and so, so there's different. <coughs> there's there's basically um, there are different interpretations for the the, the, the kind of the late emission was in the radio and also in the X-rays. Some people say that what we see later on is so there there was a jet, right? And and this jet is going this direction. But over time, you start to see more and more of the jet. And in the beginning, if you're sitting over there, you, you don't really see that much. But suddenly, at some point, you actually start to see parts of the jet. And then you start to see, let's say, the X-ray emission and the radio emission from this jet. Um, so that those, those are models where hey, you, it's delayed because at first it was just pointing away from you. But over time, it was more in your direction. Others say, well, it's actually not coming from there. But there is, when you have this jet coming out, <coughs> There's probably also some kind of cocoon around it, some more kind of like a homogeneous outflow of material that also sweeps up matter, can also accelerate particles, and maybe that is producing um, like the X-rays that we see, the radio that we see. Um, that would also there would also be a bit of a delay there as well, because it is just kind of like lagging behind the jet that goes in front. So which one of the two is correct? We don't know yet. So that's actually where the, 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 uh, the observations that are, that are going on right now and are going to continue into the future uh, can really help with uh, answering that question. Yeah. So there's a lot of still um, to, come, um, to come for this particular event. And of course, hopefully in the future, uh, with more of these gravitational waves event where there are wave events where there's also uh, um, light observed, we can learn much, much more. Um, so then there's also other um, source, of course, where there are jets. Um, and I already mentioned, if you have a compact object like a neutron star or a black hole and some kind of a regular star around it, then the matter from this regular star can move towards the compact object in a crescent disk, slam on there, and in some cases you can get an outburst of, uh, ma of material and, and radiation. And, um, and then... Uh, we call this an X-ray binary, and um, <coughs> also there, radio can be really important uh, because also in that case, just like with the AGN, the active galactic nuclei jets, you can also there use the radio to really map out these jets and see how two sides of the jet are actually moving away from each other, um, and again, very very close to the speed of light. That's what you see there um, on the right. You see the little cross; it's kind of the middle, and you see how the two blobs are kind of moving in two directions, and you can measure how fast they're moving, and it turns out they're moving almost with the speed of light. And besides um, uh, these jets, at uh, the small scales, uh, and with small being, let's say, size of roughly a st stellar size, um, I just want to say one more thing going back to the, the bigger sizes, uh, which are the, uh, the so-called tidal disruption events. Uh, these are events only discovered actually a few years ago. They've been um, hypothesized a long time ago, decades ago. Um, the idea is that if you have a supermassive black hole that is maybe not very active, um, and you get a star that gets too close to that black hole, then it will get ripped apart. Part of the, uh, or at least distorted, part of that, the material of the star would then fall into the accretion disk around the black hole, and part of the material uh, would be flung out. And that material, that extra material that falls into the accretion disk, could then also fall into, uh, get closer and closer and closer, and could then kind of reactivate this supermassive black hole. 
And so there, uh, and when this particular event was discovered, uh, they were talking about a dormant black hole suddenly waking up again. And then getting, uh, and suddenly uh, jets coming out of this um, supermassive black hole. So it suddenly became an AGN again. And, um, um, and, and this one, actually the, kind of the, 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 the funny thing was that this was discovered with SWIFT. Uh, and at first people thought that this was just a really, really funny gamma ray burst. But then very quickly realized that this was well, a little bit too funny for a gamma ray burst. And then started thinking about other things. And then suddenly realized that the way it was behaving was actually exactly as was, was uh, predicted actually by Martin Rees, I think in the 60s. Who said like, well, you should have these so-called tidal absorption events. And then they, they compared and said, oh yes, that's actually exactly what's happening here. So... Um, and so, kind of to, to um, round up this, this part, uh, there, there's all these different kind of sources. They, um, they all have these, these jets, these sudden, uh, these sudden explosions or sudden uh, emissions of radiation. And the radio part is very important. So, in everything that I've said so far, most of these sources have been found at first with, let's say, X-ray satellites and gamma-ray satellites. And then everybody else went after them after that. So it's always been in the radio, kind of following up what others have already done. And then, of course, you get, you get very important information from the radio. But what now if you try to turn things around? And uh, because maybe we are actually missing things. But if we are just only following up, maybe we're actually missing something that happens at the same time, let's say, a gamma ray burst as this flash of gamma rays, why wouldn't there be a flash of radio waves? But we don't know because we don't actually haven't really looked. And um, so, this, so basically, uh, this, with doing only a follow-up, it's kind of incomplete. The problem is to, to really look for new sources, to look for transient sources, you need a very large field of view to scan the sky and also really good sensitivity. And this is something that you almost get for free when you build kind of X-ray and gamma ray um, satellites, or at least as using certain techniques. Uh, but in radio, that's much harder to do. Most of these radio telescopes in the past always had a very tiny field of view, really tiny patch of the sky that gets observed at one given time. And basically, because the uh, computing power was not good enough to actually go to larger fields of view, but nowadays we can. And that has kind of prompted a whole new generation of uh, radio telescopes, uh, and especially at the lower radio frequencies. So, uh, and here is uh, our, our five examples. Um, there are, are more. Um, so, but the, uh, the first uh, ones were basically the low frequency array, uh, LOFAR in, in Europe, uh, the long wavelength array actually here in the US, and the Murchison Whitefield Array in Australia. Uh, Meerkat in South Africa and also ASCAP um, in Australia. Uh, and I just want to highlight a few of these and kind of highlight how they are doing their observations and how can they can help to actually find new sources in the radio, independent of whatever is found with X-ray, gamma ray, optical satellites. So first of all, um, the low frequency array. Um, the uh, up here, uh, the top left, you see a, a map of uh, Northern Europe, uh, where every kind of yellow, orangey point there is um, a, a field of antennae, lower antennae, and um, it's kind of hard to see, but lower antennae are actually really simple things. They're basically just dipoles, they're basically just four sticks in the ground with a little bit of electronics at the top. Uh, that's maybe very simply put. I mean, it's pretty smart electronics. But uh, still, actually, it, it, it is not very difficult hardware. It's not uh, a big dish of like 25 meter diameter uh, that you somehow have to maneuver in a certain way. They're just sticks in the ground. It, it, it's, it's static. They're just there. But then there's a lot of them. And we're really in terms of, uh, in the far, you're talking about 10,000 of these in different places. And then you want to correlate the, stick, the signals of those different antennae. So there are stations of the antennae. So one of these stations has about almost 100 of one type and 100 of other type. There's two different types depending on the, uh, the observing frequency. Um, and then from all these different stations, the core is in the northeast of the Netherlands. 
you have a few around it in the Netherlands, and then you have these stations in other countries in Europe. And, um, and everything is brought together in one big computer, high-performance computing um, station in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and it's really just a software telescope. So the hardware is relatively simple, everything happens in the computer. And with that, because you have everything happening in the computer, you can use these kind of tricks that I mentioned earlier of looking for very uh, um, point-like sources with very good resolution, but also using the sensitivity of the entire array to get an idea of what the diffuse emission looks like. And if you do that, oh, unfortunately it doesn't really come very well, but here you can have, for instance, M82, where you can see here kind of the reddish, kind of diffuse stuff. I mean, this is a very large uh, system here, but you can also at the same time see these kind of point sources here. And, um, and this is one particular, <coughs> excuse me, one particular source on the sky. But if we now, um, because it's low frequencies and it's built to have a very large field of view, you can actually scan the sky very, very efficiently. And this is a map that you see here, made in about, um, I think this is about an hour or so of observations. Over there you see the size of the moon in the top left, and you can see how large of a part of the sky you're actually observing in, in such a short time, uh, time frame. And also uh, how many sources you can actually see there. So in that kind of way, you're very quickly going over the sky, and you can, you can just search for uh, transits for new sources. Um, and so this is, and LOFAR was kind of the first, let's say, one, the first generation one, have this new generation of, of radio telescopes. Um, then uh, there's also in South Africa, Meerkat. Um, so this is a more, let's say, conventional design of telescope. You can see there, uh, this is actually a picture taken very recently, uh, because all the, uh, the Meerkat antennae are, uh, are now in place, uh, all 64 of them. Uh, and, but these are real dishes. So this is not the, the, the simplest kind of thing. These are real uh, dishes. And um, already last year, with only 16 of the 64 antennae, uh, Meerkat had its first light. And um, of course, if you're building uh, in a country like in, in South Africa, um, there's a lot of infrastructure that actually was not really there. Um, and, and there was a lot of work that had to be done. Um, but they, they've done an amazing job. Uh, and this was one of the first light uh, images. Um, and this is one part of the sky um, where they found about 200 sources where in previous observations with other telescopes, uh, including VLA and other sources, other um, really good telescopes, only five were known. It was the ones with the circles around them. All the other ones are completely new. What's the size of the field of that? Um, this is about... Um, Let's see, I think this is about square degree. What? A square degree, roughly. Yeah. Um, so this was only with, with um, 16 <coughs> of the final 64 dishes. Uh, and there's also a lot of detail. Uh, if you look here, um, and you can see actually um, a lot of the uh, kind of jet-like structures, jet-like sources. Uh, you see a lot of these where there is basically there is three points or two points, which are probably all little jets, uh, or really large jets, but just very far away, uh, that you're seeing in all these radio images. In a lot of the images, there has been three points. Is yes. the center point the actual source, and then the other two points the right. jet striking ISM or something? Correct. Okay. Right. A lot of these, it's actually, yeah, the center is kind of the active galactic nucleus, and the other ones are then these radio lobes where the jet interacts with the, with the medium around it. Yeah. And in the case, for instance, let's say for the, the X-ray binaries, also there's the, the center area and then the base of the jet, let's say, and then you have uh, where it's mostly interacting uh, with, um, with the, the, the interstellar medium in that case. What are the frequencies of, of Meerkat and uh, those are? So uh, Meerkat is at first at 1.4 gigahertz um, and it's going to expand into a few gigahertz. Uh, so basically from 1 to about 3 gigahertz. And um, low far ranges from about 20 up to 240 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, earlier. Sorry? That was shown on the slide earlier, the frequency range. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So the one thing is with LOFAR is that the, there is a range that is actually excluded, um, which is right around 100 megahertz because that's where the FM radio band is. So, yeah, <laughs> there's a problem when you go to these low radio frequencies. Actually, one of the kind of funny things is, or interesting things is that uh, when, when LOFAR was built, um, people, some, some people in the community thought that they were crazy of doing this because the Netherlands is one of the most dense populated countries in the world. Um, and so to build a, a radio, low frequency radio telescope right there uh, might not be the smartest thing to do, but it actually um, it's, it's working amazingly well and uh, some very, very smart people have managed to build software that actually takes care of a lot of the noise generated by people to, to actually do this. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I just want to say a few more things about actually, so looking for these transients in the radio um, there's actually some really big challenges that, we, that we've had to face and still sometimes facing trying to figure out. Some of these have been solved and others um, we're still working on. Um, the thing is, with, if you have, let's say, these 10,000 antennae, if you're combining all these data together, uh, there's an enormous amount of data. So the amount of the data volume is just is, is, is gigantic. Uh, both the raw data and then also the process data, the images that you make and everything. Um, so this, this takes a lot of computation power and, and computation time to actually do this. Um, but then if you finally made all those images, now you want to look through all those images for new things in there, for transients. Um, if you have a lot of these images, um, well, you can do two things, or you um, find a lot of funding to get a lot of graduate students. Um, or uh, you, you, some, you have to figure something out to do this automatically. Uh, and we went for the second option. It still takes a lot of graduate students to actually uh, fine-tune that whole system. But, um, uh, but it is, uh, um, automating that is, is not easy, but, but we're getting there. Um, so as for there, there are so many sources, so many images. Uh, and then also actually what we ideally want to do is search for these things in real time so that if there's something exciting, we can tell the others, we can tell the people with the optical telescopes and the X-ray and gamma ray satellites, like, hey, that's where you have to look. Right? So doing that also, of course, that takes then a whole automation process. Um, I will skip over the, the technical part here. If you'd like to know more, I'd be happy to tell you more about that later. Um, so <clears throat> it does turn out that the, low, the, the radio sky, low frequency radio sky, is not extremely active. Uh, but there are some very curious sources out there. This is just an example of a source that Lofer has found where there were three kind of consecutive observations, all of about 10 minutes, uh, and it was a very clear case of nothing there, something there, nothing there. Uh, the source that was there suddenly was extremely bright, uh, and we have absolutely no clue what it was. And, it's really, and we start to kind of build up now a sample of not many, but a sample of these kind of short-lived, a few minutes uh, timescale sources at these low radio frequencies, and we don't really know very well what these things are. They're very bright, but it's very hard to really pin, pin them down. Uh, and the problem here for, uh, especially has been that most of these have been found in old data. So when you then finally find them and then you go and look for them, of course it's like a year later or something, so there's nothing really there anymore. So that's why we're working towards actually doing automated triggering. So LOFAR, actually two weeks ago, has started automated triggering uh, on, on that, that system is now um, finally working. So hopefully we get a lot of interesting science out of that. Is that 30 minutes between the first and the last of those? Right, so they're all... to get the time scale. Yes, yes, so they're all about 10 minutes long and then in between observations they're like two minutes or something. Thank you. Yeah, and actually this one, uh, trying to kind of chop it up into smaller time slices, um, and it, it seems that it's, it's about five to seven minutes long. Yeah. So <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to um, uh, to mention is uh, uh, V light. This is a new system on the v very large array. Uh, the very large array observes a lot of different radio frequencies, but there is now a system on it, um, a commensal system. Um, that is basically always co-observing, so kind of an, an extra set of eyes 
it is always looking at just one given um, radio frequency, um, and whatever the v VLA is looking at is also looking at that particular frequency. Um, so it cannot really choose where it's looking, it's just always looking with it, but of course it's perfect for looking for transients, because it's always on. Right? You may not be eh, really, in, you're not in control of where you're looking, but it's always on. And because the very large array has large programs where they go back to the same part of the sky very often, there's a lot of data that you can look through, and it's actually a pretty large field of view, um, so you can actually look for transient sources. And so to, to illustrate this, um, and so this the, the, the frequency is about 350 megahertz. On the left, you see uh, a map of the entire sky with uh, 12 months um, of, so a year of observations in that particular radio frequency. On the right, you see in almost a year what V light has seen. And the red is where basically where you've had a lot of observations. Right, so there are some fields of the sky, and well, the, the overall coverage is much better. We also see some parts of the sky where there's a lot of observations. And especially the one up here, the so-called cosmos field, um, there's like hundreds of, of hours on the, just that one particular part of the sky that we can look for transient sources. Uh, and one <coughs> um, uh, kind of sources that um, also have recently a lot of attention in the radio domain are the so-called fast radio bursts. These are very bright um, radio sources um, of which we don't really know very well um, what they are. And um, they're, they're very short, just only a few milliseconds, but extremely bright, then disappear again. Uh, and the one problem there is, again, kind of with the gamma ray bursts in the beginning, we didn't really know exactly where they were. And, and now the radio, again, we're trying to pinpoint these things on the sky, and it's not very, very easy to do when they're so short. So uh, this is something uh, added that we hope to um, find with some of these new facilities. And, and it really kind of like, had to find kind of look into the future, yeah, where is all of this then going? Well, all these facilities like, uh, ooh, this is very dark, uh, all these facilities like, like LOFAR, uh, Meerkat and all the other ones, they're basically all kind of precursors uh, towards the big kind of new international radio project called the Square Kilometer Array. Um, this is um, uh, going to be a very large uh, interferometer, part of it going to be in South Africa and part of it in Australia, there's about 20 countries participating in this. Um, but this is, uh, LOFAR is already a big challenge in terms of data volume and going through all this data and the amount of data it produces, uh, the square kilometer array, the SKA, is going to be an even bigger challenge. Um, in terms of the data that is produced, already now, actually, uh, not all the lower data is actually stored because the transport of the data and actually getting it in a place, um, it's too much. The SKA is going to produce much, much more. This is a machine is supposed to run in the early 2020s, so just only a few years from now, um, in terms of the, the data volume and the data rate it produces, um, the data rate of the SKA is going to be twice to three times as large as the current worldwide internet data traffic rate. <laughs> How are we going to do it? That is... And something we'll have to figure out. <laughs> bigger computers. Uh, yes. Well, the the, phone, the the thing, yeah, the thing is, yes, bigger computers. But it's it's not only the it's the storage, it's the transport, but also it's the power that you actually need to do all of this because a bigger computer also needs bigger cooling, uh, and all these things. Actually, if you want to do this, you would have to basically build an entire power plant next to this one telescope to basically make it run, which is just yeah. So there's a lot of challenges there, which we'll have to figure out. So having said all of that, I um, hope you get a bit of a flavor eh, of these, these jet sources, these transients that we're looking at, and what kind of role um, the radio plays, and um, the hunt will continue. So thank you all for your... Uh, Any more questions? Yes? Yeah. How long are these uh, are these things? Are, are they miles, thousands of miles, light years? 
Yes, so that really depends on the source where it's coming from. So uh, typically, um, let's say the, the jet in um, and coming from, let's say, a gamma ray burst or one of these extra binaries or something, uh, it's, it's basically it's, it's, it's related to, to its size. So that is, let's say, the size of roughly a star uh, or a very big star. The jets are then maybe up to about an order of magnitude larger than that. Uh, the same that in the, uh, the supermassive black hole, these are these enormous things, then, uh, then these jets are also one or two orders of magnitude larger than those. Okay. Right, so that depends really on the object where it's coming from. Okay. Yes. Do uh, all jets start out as uh, emission of um, relativistic particles and they can transform to uh, radiation or are there other things going on? No, most of the time, yes, they are. So the material gets it accelerated to almost speed of light, so relativistic um, velocities. Uh, and then in most cases in the radio what you see is, so, is synchrotron radiation, so that is these um, these very fast moving particles in a magnetic field get, uh, and when they're accelerated in there, they start to radiate. Mm -hmm. And in most cases in the radio, that's what we see. Um, however, for the very short so um, bursts, so let's say the, the, the fast radio bursts, but also other sources, uh, there can also be other radiation mechanisms like coherence emission. Um, these are actually emission mechanisms where we don't know as much about as, about, as we know about synchrotron radiation because it is fairly standard. If you just take electromagnetic theory, you can work out the equations for synchrotron radiation and it all works beautifully. Uh, coherent radiation is, is not as clear. Um, a pulsar, pulsars, for instance, are, are thought to be coherent uh, radiators, but we don't really understand the emission from the pulsars that well. Um, I, mean, I use them and we see what they do, but the actual emission mechanism is not that easy to really uh, pinned down yet. Do we have any any beginning of sort of a taxonomy of, of these different kinds of things? That, so so we start out with the source and then we end up with with, with, with what we see? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh no, definitely. So there, there is definitely... I mean, uh, astronomers are, are kind of in general I think pretty good in classifying things and, and, putting in, <laughs> and categorizing things. Um, so, um, but yeah, but actually really then making the next step of, of really very precisely understanding the physics behind it, there are still some, some little gaps. We know where the gaps are, <laughs> because we, we've identified those, but then actually really understanding it is not that easy, especially the details, for a lot of it you'll need had to do, do some simulations, but it's not that easy to do simulations of things that move with almost the speed of light over at very large distances, while the, the, the particles themselves are very tiny. There, there's a lot of uh, constraints there to really figure it out precisely. The, again, it depends on computing power. This is it's getting better and better, but we're not there yet. Yeah. I was wondering whether, when those things are shooting out like that, is there any any resistance out there, like Bram's astralo, which is produced for radiation? Um, so, yeah, so you will get some other uh, emission as well, but um, it is basically dominated by the synchrotron radiation. Uh, so there will be different kind of emission processes at play. Um, but synchrotron is this going to be the dominant one in most of these cases. Yeah. Yes. Uh, slightly different question. Uh, have you heard anything on the radio astronomer's grapevine as to what is with uh, what is with the Arecibo dish? I presume it got hit pretty hard because basically Puerto Rico got wiped out. Right. 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 So, um, so very, very. Soon after, immediately, kind of immediately after, I saw some pictures of people like, okay, we, we're okay and still alive, kind of thing. <laughs> but that is uh, about the most I've actually heard. I think that a lot of the communications is it really difficult as it is for most of the yeah. out there. It's really mm -hmm. the restoring the. The thing is, I think that once power is restored, then you can actually really assess mm -hmm. what's going on and what is actually still working well and, and not working well. So, so I mean, I you have the tower still standing. I, I, yeah. I did hear that there were some issues. Okay. Uh, there was just yeah. one antenna with major, one of the antenna was, uh, the, the receiving antennas yeah. um, fell down. Uh, yeah, no, that's why I was the, right. the, main one, the main yeah. Gregorian feed was intact. Yeah. And, um, and, and I understand there, they've resumed operations. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, okay. Yeah. I just read yeah. about that. That place was like the best built structure in Puerto Rico. <laughs> my, my understanding was it's the National Science Foundation is, is uh, thinking about not funding it anymore <coughs> right, right. because of all these other uh, a lot of the radio telescopes. So I was wondering if this is the coup de grace or not. Yeah, so that, yeah, I, didn't, I don't know. 
I don't know if NSF is really going to then... Yeah, I mean, it, it's been, it's, it's been in, in very difficult situations for a long time already. Yeah. Um, I don't know that they will use this, let's say, to completely <laughs> chop it down. I mean, that would be quite brutal, but... Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, okay. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I was, I was just curious. <laughs> Sorry? I said they're doing it with others. Yeah, right. <laughs> that is true. That is true. NSF is threatening him even before the hurricane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. You mentioned that all the grad students that you did to crunch that data, what about crowdsourcing like Galaxy Zoo type metrics? Um, well, <coughs> it, would, it, it, it is more the... Um, um, I mean, Galaxy Zoo and those kind of things are really good in terms of, uh, again, of classifying. Eh? So humans are really good in actually seeing structure in something that, uh, that we, we don't always know how to tell a computer how to do that. Um, so, but one of the things that actually does really help is um, other kind of projects where you just use the computing power of uh, machines when they are idle. Uh, so the, the kind of like the, the Einstein at home kind of things right. where you, you use basically the computing power um, while someone is not using it. That would be more useful in this case. Yeah. There, actually, there has been talk already for a long time about loafer at home, which would be, be basically something like that where you can use that kind of crunch data on someone else's, yeah, on someone's machine. But if it's just like four antennas, that, could you get ham radio groups building their own antennas to use as part of that array? So, well, the thing is that, that the, um, I mean, you will have to all kind of hook it all up together and, and, and get the data flow going. Um, and, of course, have really good, like, positions and, and those kind of things. So, um, it's, 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 yeah, I think that that's a, bit, a little bit hard to do because it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really <coughs> add that much to the array if it's, if it's just a few individual, it, it would uh, cause more uh, headaches than actually... And really significantly adding more data. Unless you had a, a huge group of people doing that and building a whole station with like hundreds of these or something like that. Can we go back to the slide that shows the uh, fast radio burst and yes. the dispersion curve? Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's, that's milliseconds. So this thing right. lasts like 300 milliseconds. <clears throat> So, well, so, so the thing is that, um, so it sweeps through different frequencies. So the, the peak itself is only like, I think, 10 milliseconds or something, or 5 milliseconds. It's very, very short. But then it arrives at, at different frequencies at, at later and later times. Right. Sure. Because of the, the travel through the interstellar medium. So, so yeah, so then if you, if you would integrate all of it, then it becomes, of course, much broader. You but you described the, a chirp, haven't you? Sorry? You seem to describe a chirp. So, uh... Well, right, 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 yes, yes, yeah, in a sense, yeah, a different one, yeah, for a different reason. I mean, uh, yeah, and the, the, the of for gravitational wave, of course, is really the sort itself, uh, and here, here it's the, the oh, effect of the interstellar medium. Mm -hmm. So, so the essential right, peak, you know, when she disperses, it's only 10 milliseconds um, wide. Mm -hmm. Does that say something about the size of the repetition? this energy? So, uh, yes, you can get some constraints on the, on the size, and so... Um, it was relatively small. Right. Correct. Correct. And the, so the idea is the the kind of the most popular idea of for us radio radio burst is that they are neutron stars, um, or or something related to neutron stars. So neutron stars in um, other galaxies. Um, so so far um, only for one. So it it, it seems like they, they that these come in two flavors, just like the gamma ray burst, um, and that you have. Um, that there's actually um, just single burst ones, and also there's one that is a repeater. So it has these short bursts once in a while, sometimes closer to each other, sometimes nothing for a year, and then suddenly another burst. And, um, and in that case, because it was repeating, then people just started staring at that part of the sky and just waiting. And, um, and actually that worked, because they, they managed to pinpoint that source to a galaxy. And they actually found the galaxy where it happened. Um, so, and, and it turns out it, it's, it's kind of, a, it's a, the type of galaxy in which a lot of the, in, not, in which a lot of gamma ray bursts and um, super, so-called superluminous supernovae also go off, so very bright supernovae. And so, um, that makes people think, 
it's okay, so maybe the idea of something like a neutron star or something like that makes kind of sense because there may be a lot of those in that kind of galaxy, but it, that's a very loose kind of argument. But at least it starts to kind of zoom into that particular, um, uh, that one particular one, but that is the only one that's repeating. So there's also a lot of them that is just like one blast of radio waves and that's it. And so for those ones we still don't really, don't really know. Is it more likely to be a cataclysmic event or a, a so, matter falling on the surface? So the, so the thing is that the, the, the repeater, I mean, it, something has to keep going. So maybe it is something like, maybe something like a magnetar. Some people like the idea of that it, that is a, in sort of some kind of an extreme magnetar, where you just have an extreme magnetic field which gets all tangled, and then suddenly the, the magnetic field lines just get all uh, twisted together, and just you have a big eruption of and a reorganization of the magnetic field, big eruption of energy that can give you maybe those radio waves. I understand a magnetar uh, one where the jet is pointing pretty well out of it. So, no, so the magnetars. It's, it's not very clear, actually, if it's really a jet or... Um, but it can be a very small area on the neutron star surface or just above the neutron star surface where the emission is coming from. Yeah. But then mostly we see those in the cameras. We have actually seen magnetars also in the radio, but it's a little bit less clear what's going on there. But then, but then the other types of, of fast failure bursts, that's, yeah, those seem to be really cataclysmic ones because it's just like one boom and it's gone. Um, and there's different ideas, but at the moment it's basically anyone's guess. Is, is the repeat well, periodic or? Uh, no. 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 Let's uh, thank our speaker again. And...